Afternoon, everybody. Very impressive to see uh, people actually switching on to listen to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, just a number of you may know about me. Uh, just for those who say, who on earth is this guy? Uh, I was one of the original authors of Prompt 2, which was the predecessor to Prince, which then, when we kicked the IT out of it, became Prince 2. And because of my background, I was asked to write the original Prince 2 manual. And I continued writing all the updates to the manual until 2009. Uh, because I'd written the manual, Richard Farrell asked me to be the chief examiner uh, from its start until I retired last year. And at that time, I wrote the first 400 and odd foundation questions and the first 40 odd uh, practitioner papers before, in the old style before we turned over to the, the new uh, computer marked one. So I've been around a while on it and uh, since the, in fact, since the 70s. Uh, I've written a lot of books uh, mainly about it and uh, that about gives me the nerve to stand up or sit here and talk to you about it. We move on to the next one. Uh, we're looking at applying PRINCE2 to small projects and from the outset uh, we were always up against managers who would roll their eyes uh, when they saw the method, the manual and say, oh crikey, look at this. Uh, it's, it's a huge amount uh, of work on here. Look at this, too much bureaucracy, too big a management overhead. Uh, too many reports. Crikey, uh, we'll never do this, you know, I'll be stuck here doing this and we'll never get the job done. Uh, what it was very difficult to persuade a lot of managers about was the fact that Prince2 obviously as a project management method had to put everything in there so that if you had the largest kind of project you could use possibly the whole method and make it very formal uh, depending on your needs. But it was very difficult for them to see the, the ability to scale Prince2 back down to the needs for small projects. Uh, I remember when I was at BP International where I introduced Prompt2, uh, a manager coming up to me and saying, crikey, you know, this is so bureaucratic and large. Uh, can we not make a rule that if a project is worth less than £100,000, uh, it's a small project and we don't need to use it? Uh, he was desperate to avoid using it because he thought it was too much overhead. Of course, the big problem there is if you don't use a project management method, you go back in terms of your company's maturity model down to back to level one or two where every project manager comes along, reinvents the wheel, and makes all the mistakes that his predecessors or her predecessors had done and you just don't move forward at all. Uh, so what we tried to do, and that's part of the reason for my book, is to say, yes, you can use PRINCE2. It isn't uh, too much bureaucracy, and it isn't a big overhead. Uh, and again, many people looked at the thing and said, look at all these reports I've got to write. Of course, what we say is, a report can be just verbal. You can pick up the telephone, you can send someone an email, you can talk to them in a meeting. It doesn't always have to be a multi-page report uh, just because it uses the word report. Uh, many thought that using Prince2 was an overkill in setting up the project. They looked at the starting up a project process, the initiating a project process, and said, look at all this work. Uh, we'll never get to the point where we can actually start work. And there was this great huge uh, impatience, not only from the individual project managers, but from their management uh, who have often had the attitude of just do it. Why aren't you working on it already? Uh, I had one project in uh, BP Portugal where a project manager was given a project uh, to do and sort of started looking at it. And on day two, a whole team of programmers appeared. And he said, well, what's this? And management said, well, those are your programmers to program this IT thing, uh, but I'm not ready. We expect you to be using them. So uh, from day two, he had to start trying to use this team of programmers to start writing programs 
when he hadn't even really got the specification sorted out, let alone any kind of design. So you can imagine the kind of state he got into and his project. So we have to overcome the idea of it's a small project, therefore you can start it immediately, can't you? Uh, and on the reverse of that is, oh, you can't be bothered with all this starting up a project and initiating a project in Prince 2. It's too much. Why not just get on with the job? So the problem there we had was how do we overcome all of this kind of problem? What I'm going to look at today is this matter of applying a project management method to small projects. Uh, and I'm going to look at that under the four headings of really small projects. Small projects, what kind of minimum elements for control do we need? How do we approach it from another direction and try and scale down Prince 2? And do we have an example uh, of scaling Prince 2 down specifically for small projects? And the one I've got here is when I introduced Prince 2 into Tesco, the supermarket chain, and they felt that most of their projects were much too small to go for Prince 2 in its entirety. So they wrote a project management handbook based on Prince2 for what they felt were their needs. So we'll have a look at that. And then finally, we'll have a look at the irreducible core of Prince2. And what that means is these are the elements of Prince2 that you have to use in a project. If you're not using them in a project, however small, then you're not really using Prince2. So that's the four kind of areas we're going to have a look at. And let's start by having a look at really small projects. Now, what do I mean by really small projects? Uh, one or two people. Now, I'm not too worried if they say, oh, mine's three. Does that mean I'm out? What we're talking about is a very small team to write a project. It may be just yourself, two people, that kind of thing. Uh, another one would be there's no need for a business case. It's so either so blindingly obvious that this job has to be done, uh, that you don't need to say, now, what's the justification uh, for this? Do we have to have a project plan? Do we have to examine what business benefits might come out of it? Um, uh, but we don't need a major business case. We don't want to spend a lot of time during initiation in creating a business case. Uh, Short duration, usually days or weeks. And again, this is the kind of time when a lot of people came back to me and said, it's so short, clearly we don't need a project management method. What I want to try and persuade you today is you do need a basic project management method. You do need to have behind you all of the concepts of Prince 2. And you do need to understand how you can bring these down so that they can be applied to really small projects. One thing we're doing, in fact, in the schools in a certain European country is they're interested in project management for the pupils. And clearly, they're not about to say, let's try them on building a new hospital or simulate the construction of a bridge or anything like that. So they're interested in really small projects. How can we get our people to understand the basic elements? And what I've started them with is the idea from Prince2 of writing out a work package. And if we have a look at the entries on the screen now, we can see uh, what would normally expect to be in a work package. A date when we're making this, a description of the work required, one or more product descriptions, uh, what techniques and procedures need to be used. And it says interfaces there. Now, we all know that in a work package, it gives you two types of interface if you're doing big formal projects. Interfaces while you're doing the work and any interfaces needed by the product you're producing when the job has been finished. You need joint agreements on effort costs, start and end dates. Any constraints? What kind of reporting is expected? How do I handle problems that come up? Uh, the approval method. 
and a, a plan extract if it's part of a larger plan clearly as it says below there you can omit any of these above that are not needed for example in many small projects it will not be part of a larger plan so you don't need the plan extract it may be so short that there's no formal reporting no reporting after two weeks three weeks end stage reports or anything like that it may be too short for these to be needed in fact any reports that you have to make can be verbal you can actually make out the entire work package verbally you can say to someone okay looking at those information there this is what I want you to do or if you're starting tomorrow I want you to do etc etc uh, if you're going to make it verbal rather than write this down you have to be absolutely sure of what you need um, this can be tricky I, I, I remember one being very dismissive and saying well I can do this verbally and she proceeded to do it verbally and when we examined what she said she'd missed out about three important items uh, that were needed again very careful now to give you an example how we can make work packages uh, for very small projects I've taken one that I did a number of years ago I had uh, someone coming along to actually clean up my garden while I was going to be uh, far too busy doing other things so here's what we did uh, we have a date when it's going to be on person authorized Dougal was the name of the gardener work package description clean up the borders hedges and patios at 42 the cuttings East Cheam and remove the garden refuse created by the work product description just one product and the title of that product was cleaned up garden and the purpose of the cleaned up garden was to be a tidy and attractive surround to the house what was the composition of a cleaned up garden weed free and bramble free borders a dead headed hydrangeas pruned roses clipped hedges borders with dead plants removed and a weed free and clean patio so that that was the composition of what was going to be the end product of this work package quality criteria I put one in there at the beginning that is fairly standard and it's so standard you can almost omit it uh, very often but way back in 2002 I put it in that the product when delivered had to meet its composition section in other words everything that I'd put under composition had to be there another quality criterion the hedge at the side of the house had to be cut on a level with the side wall the front face of the hedge to be trimmed back to present a flat even appearance all cuttings and rubbish caused by the work removed from the premises and the patio to have any surface dirt algae and weeds removed the plant pots on the patio had to be moved on the lawn during the cleaning and replaced afterwards that was what I considered to be the quality criteria the quality method was a visual inspection tools to be used you are to provide your own tools if needed a PowerPoint is available in the house porch interfaces I only put one interface in to be maintained during the work you do not need permission from my neighbor at number 40 if you have to enter her garden to do any of this work but if you need to enter the garden of number 44 I will need to get her permission first okay so that was an item there the effort we have agreed that you will do the work on Thursday the 21st of March 2002 you have estimated the work at four hours at a cost of eight pounds an hour now I regarded that particular thing as pretty crucial I was getting a contract to come in and do some work and certainly I didn't want any arguments later about what we'd agreed would be the cost etc so I made sure that I spelt out very clearly what we had discussed in this sign off I will agree completion after a satisfactory quality check any constraints the one I've mentioned already avoid entering the grounds of number 44 without first consulting me and secondly do not use any weed killers or patio cleaner fluid that may damage the law quality checking arrangements 
I will check the work against the product description for the job. Okay, now a number of things there. You notice that I didn't use all of the things. If I go back, you'll see a number of those items, plan extract, a problem handling, reporting, because it was going to be such a short job, no reporting. Uh, I didn't worry the gardener techniques and procedures to be used. I didn't worry about that except to put that he would provide all the tools, etc. And so I did omit any that are not needed, and that's perfectly fine, as long as you feel that in going through, you put in the kind of stuff that you need in order for it to be, at the end, a job, a pretty watertight job description that you can do it. Now, I tried this out on the uh, man coming to do the work and said, look, you know, is this an embarrassment? Do you work? And he said, no, this is ideal. It gives me a clear idea uh, and it avoids, at the end of the day, me coming in and holding my hand out for the money and then the owner of the house saying, but you didn't do job X, you didn't do job Y. You spelt out very clearly what I'm expected to do and by starting it means that I'm in agreement with that and the estimate of four hours at eight pounds. So it avoids any of the nasty uh, embarrassment at the end if there's any disagreement. So he was quite happy with it. And as I say, it meant that he could get on with the job uh, without disturbing me from the work that I was doing. So that's the kind of thing we looked at when talking about very small projects. If it really is very small, consider not just diving in and saying, oh, I'm sure I will remember everything about this. Look at a work package contents and write it down. According to that, don't bother with anything you don't really need, but be sure you really have considered what you do need from there. If we look at small projects which are maybe a little bit bigger than the one we've discussed, then we come on to the minimum elements for control. Again, one of the problems we always had in teaching Prince 2 was that uh, people found it very difficult to understand the combining or sharing of roles. If we look at the project board, you should have an executive, a senior user, and a senior supplier. And you can find out uh, to whom those roles belong by saying, for this project, who is providing the money? Who controls what the user wants from the project? And who controls the people who will provide the solution? Now, as we've always said with Project Board, you need people on the Project Board who are able to commit. Executive able to commit the money you need, able to commit that this is what the customer wants, and a senior supplier that says, I can commit the resources to actually get the job done. Is that one person? Is it one company? Whatever it may be. It's always quite difficult to, to persuade the project board that they are ultimately responsible for the project. Not the project manager. The project manager proposes that they are ultimately responsible. I remember when I was with BP, I asked the committee of senior managers there in IT, who is responsible for quality in your project? The project manager, they said. And what happens if a customer comes to you and complains about the quality of a product that you've delivered? Oh, we kick the project manager's backside. OK. I went then to Sycon, which is a consultancy company uh, owned at that time by BP. And I said to their people, OK, who is responsible for quality? The managing director. Oh, uh, how come the managing director? And they said, well, if the managing director is responsible for quality, uh, you better make sure that you deliver quality, otherwise you'd be in uh, you know, very bad order if any customer comes to him and complains that his quality is a failure. And they said, also, many of our contractors, including the Department of Defense, we wouldn't get the job unless someone as senior as our managing director 
who's responsible for quality. So the idea of quality being down at the level of project manager and nothing to do with the project board, not really a runner. But can any, for a small project, you should be able to ask the question, can any roles be combined? Now, for it, very easily often, the executive and senior user both come from the customer, it's in their area of work, and usually whoever is providing the money is quite able to say, I can write at the bottom my signature to say, yes, this is exactly what we want. So very often in small projects, you can find that the executive and senior user can be the same person. Whether you can combine the senior supplier role with those two depends. If it's an outside agency, then the answer is clearly no. You know, your, your manager cannot be responsible for the work of an outside organization. If you've got lots of suppliers, then it's, well, firstly, it's un unlikely to be a small project. But uh, if that were to come up, then probably you would find someone in your contracts department uh, who would take the role of senior supplier and arrange to deal with all the various suppliers. But normally in a small project, you'll either have one external supplier, but in many, of course, it may be that it's an internal project. If we give you an idea, if we had, locally we had uh, a trades company that uh, offered building products uh, around and he looked at some of his products, uh, cement and so on, and said, hmm, uh, they're left open in the open air at the moment and bad weather can really destroy some of these. I want to build uh, a little shed over there. We actually sell sheds, uh, so I will get some of my people to actually erect the shed in the corner of the yard and we will put all these products in there. So he was the executive because he was paying <coughs> for the job to be done. He was also the C user because he'd had the requirement and he was going to specify exactly what he wanted from his people. And it turned out it was his people who were going to build the shed in the corner and put the stuff in there. So in fact, he turned out, as will happen in many small projects, to be the executive, the senior user, and the senior supplier all rolled into one. So I found many people, when you talk to them, uh, without this experience, will say, ah, you might find that the executive and senior user roles can be combined, but you will always have a separate senior supplier. That's not the case. If you have a look at who is supplying the resources, it may well be that they come under the control of the same person who is the executive. <coughs> so, is it one person? If we look at the third element of the talk today, the minimum elements for control. If you're going to have a project at all, you need to feel that you are in total control of what's going on. Now, if you look at PRINCE2, the minimum elements there are, it says business case. As you all know, PRINCE2 says, if you don't have a business case, don't do the project. If your business case disappears, stop the project. So in a small project, you should have a business case. Minimally, the reasons. Okay, why are we doing this? Ideally, the benefits, but you may not uh, have time or you may not have a real need uh, to do those for the small project. It depends on the circumstances. I'll give you one example from my background. BP Exploration came to the IT department and said, look, here we have the results uh, from a South American country of some seismic surveys we did in an area that we think might contain either oil or gas. Uh, we have a very, very limited time to analyze this seismic survey before the contract comes up for renewal. And if it comes up for renewal and we are not ready to say yes or no, it will go to someone else. So we have a very short time span and we need to know is there oil or gas down there according to the results of this seismic survey. Now, that was their business case. If, we, if there is oil and gas down there, we need to be quickly in to get the contract. 
if there isn't anything there, we don't want to spend a lot of money in renewing the contract. There's going to be nothing down there. Very simple to do <coughs> and very quick. You really need to know for any, any project, any small project uh, of any size really, what the customer's expectations are. Do they expect it to be a perfect product? Do they expect it to be, okay, well, I don't mind how it looks as long as it's accurate. You can think of in BP explanation getting the results of that seismic survey. It didn't have to be a glossy presentation, but it had to be accurate. So what are the quality criteria? Now at the beginning, you can ask what the quality criteria are for the end product. If your small project will deliver several products, one after another, maybe several together, then as you move through that small project, you can find or define more detailed quality criteria for any one of those products. When you get down to the detail, that's when you need to say, ask yourself, okay, how do we firstly build that quality into the product? When can we check that that quality is there and who's going to do it? In a small project, you still need at least one plan. You may need more, depends what how small small is, but you certainly need a project plan. Uh, in my opinion, you probably need a very, very simple plan to say how are you going to get to the point where you ask the project board to commit and say yes, get this done. That may be something you can do in a few minutes, but it, it's still a plan. But you certainly need a plan for your project. Now, depending upon the size of your small project, it may be possible to build into that one physical project plan all the detail that you need for the work to be done to allow you to control it on a day-to-day -day basis. I did know, uh, I live on the south coast, and I did know a, a company that built bits and pieces for these uh, very expensive yachts. Uh, they used to build things like hatches for them. And I talked to one director who said he was very concerned about the project management going on in the company. I went in to see the, the one project manager they had who looked after all their projects and asked if I could see uh, the documentation. And he produced, uh, <laughs> I'll not call it a spreadsheet, it's a very good sp spreadsheet of weeks going along the top. And he certainly had all his projects down the left-hand side. And he simply blocked them in and said, that's when that one's going to happen, this one will happen then, etc. Nothing lower than that level and nothing in any kind of detail to do with it at all. Uh, I tried to persuade him that he needed a little more than that, but got nowhere. And uh, he said, they're all, all very simple jobs. So I said, well, what happens if, uh, where are your hatches going? Oh, it might be in one of these uh, ocean going yachts um, that sails out of the Caribbean or out of America. And what happens if you've got a quality problem with it? Oh, we probably have to send someone over there to sort it out. Uh, and it didn't didn't really sink into him that you know the money spent in sending somebody out to fix a problem was pretty expensive for a small project in his company and didn't really do his reputation as a, a quality manufacturer a great deal of good with the customer. But it was impossible to persuade him that he had to know the quality expectations and how he was going to deliver that quality. Risk, yes, it's essential. You don't need to spend, again, huge amounts of time. You don't probably need a risk manager or anything theatrical like that. But you do need to study before you dive in and say, hang on a second, what are the risks facing us? Are there any internal risks? Risks about the resources I'm going to need? Risks about the user's demands changing? Are there any external risks? What's happening to our competition? What's happening in government that might change what we're doing? 
what kind of risks are we facing? Is there a risk of a threatened uh, civil service strike like we're having at the moment? Is there a risk of uh, a strike in airlines that will affect either getting in some products that we need or getting some people out to a certain destination and so on? So you can't do any small projects, any projects of any size, without considering risk. Change control, yeah. One thing that can destroy any project, whether it looks small or not, is failure to control changes. You have to really think hard at the beginning, and you have to have a standard within your company to say, how are we going to handle change requests? And you've got to control those, otherwise your time frame will disappear out of the window, and your costs will disappear out of the window. You really, really have to have change control, however small your project is. Controls and reports? Well, tolerances, yes. Uh, I need some kind of tolerance, or do I ha You need to know whether you have tolerances in terms of the time the project's going to take. Must it be delivered on such a date, or is it okay if it's within two or three days of that? What about the cost of the whole thing? Is it specifically a limit that you're faced with, or is that slightly variable? Do I need reports to be written? Can they be manual? Can they be verbal? How often do I need to report? Uh, and so on. So you need to look at those. They, again, you don't need huge amounts of it. It may be that you can report simply in an email or a telephone call for, for the duration of the project, which, again, will probably be small. As Prince 2 says, even for small projects, you need two stages. One, sort out what you're going to do about the three project board roles, just as we've discussed. Determine what is to be delivered. Plan it. Is there a business case? And the second stage, actually do it. And then at the bottom, don't forget to wrap it up. The huge, huge number of small projects that simply fade away or disappear or dribble on and on because there isn't a formal wrap-up session. Okay, You really do need to put it to bed at the end and get agreement from the project board that that project is now complete. If anything wants, the usual thing is, when, oh, well, I wanted a little bit more, fine. That's a different small project, a little enhancement project, but it is a separate entity. Otherwise, you're never, never really going to be able to go back to them and say, how do you measure me against delivering this project? And if you're not careful, they'll start talking about how it took a lot longer and cost a lot more. But what they're talking about is the changes that they came along and asked you to make that were not there originally. And when you came and said, here's the finished product, oh, I want something a little bit more, something a little bit more. And in their mind, they tacked it on and it becomes part of the same project and then they start saying, well, look, you delivered it late, or it costs too much. Don't let them do that. Wrap up that project and say, anything else is a new project. When I was with Tesco's, looking at Tesco's, I worked with them, and they had, as I said earlier on, decided that the whole thing of Prince was too big, especially they, they looked at the eight processes as they were in those days, and they said, no, we're, we want to modify the compress them a little. So in the end, we came out with four. Visualize, plan, do, review. On the visualize, they said, we're going to appoint a project board, produce a draft project brief, identify what the measures of success are. In other words, how will we, at the end, measure whether this is a successful project or not. And then they linked in the first action, if you like, from the DP process. They included authorize the plan process. In the plan process, they finalized the whole project initiation document, prepared detailed plans. This worried me a little, but they said, well, this is 
almost all our projects are small. So we can, at this stage, prepare detailed plans because the do is going to be just one fairly short period of weeks. So we pl plan all the detail there. And then again, bring it in from DP. We will authorize the due process. In due, action the detailed plans, manage and review deliverables, track and report results, agree any changes. Again, they had to bring that in. And finally, again from DP, authorize the review process. And part of the review was hand it over, review the results and target changes, review performance, and authorize closure. And then at a later date, conduct a benefits review. So again, they reduced that down. Uh, they felt that that was a, it looked a huge amount more. Uh, what we've got here is simply uh, a compression into plan of all the planning which uh, is done in print in IP, initiating a project, and then in managing uh, the end of a stage. So very little contract really, but they felt that that was more in line with uh, getting people to accept this is something they could do in small projects. Lastly, I said we'd have a look at the irreducible core of PRINCE2, and here we are. A business case, yeah. I think it says often enough in the manual of PRINCE2, and quite correctly so, you've got to have a business case. I remember when I started as consultant uh, for the health service in Northern Ireland, oh no, we don't need to worry about a business case, we've been told we don't need that, uh, which worried me, but they carried on, and then suddenly they came back and said, oh yeah, um, our senior management have told us we now do need a business case. So they came back on board, which made me feel much more comfortable. You've got to have a project organization. You have to know who is responsible for what and who your decision makers are. Remember one of the problems, you don't want people on your project board who simply have an opinion. If they can't make a decision, they're not on the project board. One or more plans, you certainly need a project plan. Whether you need more plans than that or whether you need to uh, have more physical plans than that, again, depends on the length of your project. You do need a method for checking for and handling risks. When are you going to look for them? How are you going to monitor them? How do you evaluate risks? And so on. Change control. Yeah, if I had nothing else in my project management uh, bag, I'd have to have change control. I had too many bad experiences when I started as a project manager picking up projects from other people where there was no change control. They were an absolute disaster. You just cannot afford to be without change control. Same with quality. Quality was described to me once as like the underlay underneath the carpet. It certainly prolongs the life of that carpet, but you can't put it in after you've laid the carpet down. And with quality, you've got to get your expectations first and recognition of how this will be built into the products. In the bad old days, when I started in IT, we only used to have one real quality control, and that was when we used to go to user acceptance testing. And we discovered that far more of the problems uh, should have been sorted out, even at specification time. We'd left problems in right from the word go. So when you're looking at building quality in, don't wait until the end. How soon can you look at a product or a part product and ask yourself, when was product, when was the quality built into this? And you need controls to match the project organization and size. It doesn't need to be overkill, but it does need to be commensurate with, are we getting the right people looking at this 
in time that we can sort out problems before they grow too big to rescue. So that's the core. If you have a look at PRINCE2, if it's got those seven items in there, then you're well on the way to saying, I've got that. Uh, I've got the irreducible core of PRINCE2. I'm on my way to being able to say, I have a good method that I can use for small projects. OK, there we are. And uh, that should leave us about our 15 minutes for any questions and answers. How about going back to our host to see how that's going to be handled? Thanks very much, Colin. Um, okay. Yep, uh, that has been uh, fairly uh, informative. If you've got any questions now, you can either uh, let me know um, within the chat function. There is also a, uh, a function for uh, question and answers. Um, feel free to uh, use any of those. We'll just uh, give it a second uh, to wait for, uh, for a question to come in. Um, there have been a number of people who have asked whether or not these uh, these slides will be available afterwards. Uh, yes, they will. Uh, we will uh, send you an email with a link to the uh, a cop where you can download uh, the slides. Uh, we'll also send you a link to where you can uh, make sure to uh, to grab your your copies of uh, of Colin's books. Um, yeah. Get them off our website. May I say to Robin, many thanks for your comments there. Robin, uh, it's good to know I've been able to help, but uh, that's all I need. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. There was a there was a question about uh, slide twelve. If we could go that uh, go to yeah. that again, uh, Rob, was there, uh, was there anything in particular you wanted to see on slide twelve? Is there anything you wanted to uh, say about that, uh, Colin? Sorry, I'm just looking at this. Um... Oh, he's just. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's just uh, noting down. Uh, yeah, Rob. Once again, uh, we will be able to uh, to send you the, uh, the 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 slides after yeah. the um, after the presentation. Um, there was a, uh, a question uh, from uh, from Ray. It says, um, how should the principles be linked to the uh, irreducible core? If you have a look at the uh, the principles of Prince Two, we're not a million miles away from them. You know, the business case is a straightforward. Uh, principle there, as is organization and planning, uh, risks, and uh, control. We have change control as well as configuration management and quality. So in fact, there's a, a very cross and with a correlation between these and what we have in the latest version of the Prince Manual. So we're not throwing anything away. Uh, certainly, we're just saying uh, these are the things, these are the essentials, and whether you uh, want to compress some of the processes in doing it, uh, whether you don't want to go into the huge amount of some of these things, uh, you do know you do need to be having a look at these things if you really want to stick with Prince too. And having been in many projects over the years, that uh, you know, uh, any wandering away from any of these or thinking that you can dump any one of these that we're looking at here. Uh, always, always leads to major problems uh, in that project. Uh, Colin, when is the, uh, the, next, uh, the next version of PRINCE2 due out? Do you know? Uh, I don't. Uh, I haven't heard uh, anything. They, when they brought out the 2009 version, they, the word they had, had at OGC was, you know, uh, we think we produced it, one that will stand uh, mainly for about the next five years at least. So we're still well within there, and I've been I've been submitting. I must admit, uh, especially was then earlier on, I submitted a heck of a lot of issues uh, with which I wasn't particularly happy. Some big, some small, about the 2009 manual. Um, it was a major uh, move forward in terms of getting rid of a lot of my verbiage, you might say, uh, and reducing the content, but I thought we'd throw one or two things away or done them in ways that were not brilliant. And a few months ago now, I asked the same question, you know, what's happening about these? Will there be uh, any kind of move to it, any kind of group having a look at their issues? Because if you go on where issues are stored, there's uh, quite a large number uh, of issues there, some of them quite significant. And uh, I thought that was going to happen, in fact, uh, last year, 
uh, sorry, and spring of this year. Uh, but I've heard absolutely nothing about this. So uh, I'm a little in the dark as to whether there's any. It won't be a major uh, change that I know of, but uh, there should be a, a revision done, in my opinion, and uh, I think it's getting a bit overdue now. I think uh, we've had a lot of issues in that should be looked at. Uh, okay, lots of good questions coming in. Um, uh, one about, uh, do you have any recommendations for uh, what, um, uh, what is the, uh, uh, do you have a, a book that you would recommend for, uh, for small projects uh, uh, using Prince2? Yeah, uh, I've got a, a book out which is Prince2 for small projects, and I think that covers it. Uh, I wrote a useful one, thinking of, I used to, uh, I was on holiday in, in Cornwall when I wrote a book, The Art of Prince 2 Survival, which was um, useful in that it, I put in there, and I put in now, a lot of uh, practical examples of the various forms like uh, communication, uh, strategy, uh, configuration management strategy, and all the ones that people look at for the first time and think, oh gosh, you know, I'm faced with a blank piece of paper. What on earth do I write? So I put a lot of those in there, as well as digging underneath uh, a lot of the things. And for some of the things I've said today, I said, OK, look, this is what he doesn't say about this particular item. And this is how you actually need to tackle it. So I think, as well as being quite humorous, the art of Prince 2 survival is pretty good on there. Fantastic, uh, and uh, as I've said a couple times before, we'll send everybody uh, a link out to uh, to that book and uh, uh, both of the books that uh, the Colin mentioned there. Um, question: um, Is uh, is quality control required to be handled by someone independent of the project, or uh, the project manager uh, can bind this role in small projects? Okay, um, with a small project, getting a, a different. Uh, group to come in like your quality control group for the company uh, may be on the verges of oh this is too bureaucratic this is overkill and in fact the project may be over and done with by the time they try and get their house in order and come and inspect what's done so in small projects uh, it's going to be the case more often than not where it has to be done within the project so the project manager either has to personally do that or has to have someone within the team <coughs> who can do it. I did know uh, within, I think it was uh, the council, Oxford Council, where the project manager had the option to call on a technical expert, not part of their team, but with the same skills, who would come in and review any key products going out as part of that, as you say, uh, impartial uh, review. Um, an impartial review is an excellent thing if you can do it. Uh, we are aware that with small projects it's often gone before you can uh, get a, a group uh, like quality review involved. <coughs> but the idea of asking a, a line manager for the loan for half a day, a day of someone who can be part of a review, like a quality inspection, you know, quality review of your key products uh, is good. So if you can do that, I think that as a practice, I think that's the best way of handling it. Okay. What about the uh, evaluation and learning experience? Is that is that needed in a small project? Yeah. Uh, there are a number of ways of doing that. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning work packages. I always used to write those out formally, get them signed by the individual, and then sit down with them afterwards and put at the bottom of that same work package form a review of how I felt that they'd done, which gave us any, any problems, any learning things that we needed to do, help us set us up for what kind of training might be needed in future, and also <coughs> form part of my annual review of that person's work. So that was useful down at that level. Uh, a lot of companies use small projects and you can get <coughs> a company coming in from outside with Prince2 knowledge and with these runs and saying, 
okay, we will work with your people and we will ensure that in this small project we do a transfer of skills. Uh, for example, in the, I did project management handbooks not only for Tesco but for the um, <coughs> so, uh, what's the group in London dealing with that one? I'll forget them. So, um, about four I've done where you go in with a book where you've tailored that one. Oh, and Microsoft Europe was another one I did. Where you tailor it to their needs, you go in and you work through a project with them and you're, <coughs> you're basically hand holding the project manager through that and transferring the skills and bringing them into that one. Um, I, I noticed there's a question here from Anthony Mapple. Has the speaker got an example of a work package document? Uh, yes, I have. Um, what's the easiest way? I could give you my email address and if they write to me, I could email it to them. That's very easy. If you want to do that, how would you feel about that? That would be uh, that would be fine. Yeah, if uh, if you want to give out your your email address, otherwise, um, uh, if you want to send it to uh, send your request to Service Center, that's uh, spelled the, with the British spelling, Service Center, all one word, at itgovernance.co.uk, we'll uh, we'll make sure that, uh, that that gets forwarded to uh, to Colin. Yeah, and I'll be happy to provide them and uh, details of any of the other documents, but certainly the work package. I've got several examples of that. And, and any um, small project case studies that uh, that you would be willing to share? Sorry, uh, do you have any case studies for uh, for uh, small projects? Yes, I've got a couple uh, that we did. Uh, one used prints too for actually starting up a company, which was quite an interesting way of doing it. And another one used it to get her. She used to do uh, portrait painting, and she used prints too. To actually get that onto the web and you know get some advertisement onto the web so yeah got a couple of examples uh, available on that uh, there was a question about um, prints 2 being uh, mapped with uh, with agile methods such as uh, scrum do you, have a, do you have a view on that yes uh, in fact uh, I, I wrote something on comparing well the use of prints 2 and agile um, agile doesn't quite use Prince2 in an unabridged fashion and there are one or two differences in the approach but in the main uh, yes uh, the, with the agile approach which I mean years ago when I used to work with a guy a Swedish guy called Tom Gill he used to work on something called evolutionary development uh, which uh, now in a far more structured form is basically what Agile is and we worked, crikey, that would be back in the 70s, uh, looking at how we could use that and the major difference as you'll see in Agile is the need to keep refreshing and having a look at your business case as you move through and decide which bits you're going to do and you know, having to justify them as you move through a, a project. But apart from that, yeah, uh, I have quite a quite a bit of documentation on comparing Prince 2 and Agile. So again, if anybody's interested in those and writes to you, we can make those available. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's see, there was another question about um, uh, golden rule on selecting which processes are used for small projects. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to be a million miles away from that small example that I gave from Tesco. You need something at the beginning. You know, the main thing to avoid is diving in to a project without thought and without planning. You can almost guarantee you're going to forget things, things will come up and you'll miss things. So you do need the patience and the discipline to say, okay, you know, we're going to spend a little time at the beginning making sure we know what we're doing, what we're asked to be doing, and how we're going to do it. So the key there is please, please make sure that you've got some kind of process to lead you up to the point where you have the equivalent, at least, of a PID. You need something on there. Uh, having gone through there, if it's a small project, 
you can probably have one plan covering all of your activities, but you do need that pause before you get people to commit and say, have we actually thought enough about this to know what we're doing? Uh, then do the rest in one project. As long as, as I say, you've got change control, you've got risk, you've had a look at risks, and you know what quality is needed, which is part of your initial thinking, and how you're going to deliver that quality. Okay, once you've got those items in there, you're almost there. With a small project, that's it. Think before you start. Understand how you're going to deal with changes. Understand what quality is needed and how you're going to do it. And that's about it. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Colin. I think that's about um, all the time we have uh, for today. Um, uh, like I said, uh, I've said it a number of times, we'll be sending out the uh, uh, links where you'll be able to download the slides. Um, if you want to contact us uh, for, uh, for any of the additional materials that, uh, that Colin has mentioned, um, we can be reached at uh, service center at itgovernance.co.uk. Um, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Colin. Uh, for uh, for giving us the time, uh, I'm uh, I'm sure I, I hope you all found it as as useful as I did. Um, we will uh, be running uh, more webinars in the new year, but uh, until then, um, thank you everybody. Thanks for being there. I've enjoyed it too. Okay, cheers. Then.